Good afternoon, everybody. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the CDEC Building Energy Education for Architects webinar. Um, before we get started, um, the Executive Vice President, Ms. Stacy Fingston, uh, wanted to make a brief announcement to everyone. So, Stacy. Hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. I'm Stacy Finkston, uh, Executive Vice President of AIA Illinois, and we are thrilled to have all of you attending this uh, beginning of our webinar series in partnership with CDAC. I first of all would like to thank Sumi Han and Brian Deal and uh, the team of CDAC for putting together this important three part webinar series. Um, this year in 2021, AIA Illinois made this a priority for this three part webinar series. Uh, to train our architects throughout the state and so you would be able to attend for free and we are thrilled that everyone's taking advantage of this uh, i think today we had over 300 uh, architects throughout the state registered so that is really great and we hope you take advantage of the other two in this three-part series uh, taking place this spring uh, whether it's through training or policy uh, better building energy efficiency is a priority for AIA Illinois in the coming years. And we look forward to this continued partnership with CDEC and please enjoy this training session and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. <clears throat> so that was part of our presentation today. Um, CDEC is a uh, preferred education provider with the International Code Council. Um, we won't be touching too much into the energy code today, uh, but we will be touching on some highlights on uh, as far as compliance with the energy code and documenting compliance for building efficiency. Um, and so we do offer IECC um, continuing education credits and we also have education credits available for AIA. If you uh, will get a uh, completion certificate at the conclusion of this webinar. Once that is emailed to you, reply to that email with your AIA member number and we can process those continuing education credits for you. Uh, CDEC is an applied research program at the University of Illinois. We are housed at the Urbana-Champaign campus. We have a mission to reduce the energy footprint of Illinois and beyond. Um, to achieve that goal, um, this is one of many programs, um, but this particular webinar is one, as Stacy mentioned, in a three-part series. Today we'll be covering the thermal envelope. Our next one will be in April. We'll be covering lighting and electrical energy efficiency. And then in May, we'll touch on indoor air quality and comfort and uh, HVAC systems. CDAC provides technical support to uh, agencies throughout the state in order to support their energy efficiency goals. Uh, we can be reached at cdac-info at illinois.edu. And we also have a 1-800 number if you need to call us with a pressing concern. And we have multiple online resources, including links to energy code uh, compliance information and uh, helpful tips, blog posts on current energy efficiency issues and sustainability issues. Uh, we have smart tips and technical notes uh, to help you find new information on technologies 
and ways to become more energy efficient. Um, this particular link details our links to our energy code information and resources, but we also have a wide range of blog posts, newsletter articles, technical notes, and other facility smart tips that are available for you to use uh, to help increase energy efficiency at your facilities. Uh, today we're going to be touching on uh, four main learning objectives. Uh, we're going to be understanding how the building as a whole interacts um, with the building's thermal envelope uh, to increase its energy efficiency and comfort of occupants within the building. We're going to be learning about schematic and massing studies for thermal envelope efficiency, how you orient your building and, and place thermal mass within the structure to take advantage of um, the ability of thermal mass to store and redistribute energy and loads. Um, identifying problems and solutions with envelope details based on heat transfer methods, uh, figuring out where the most common issues uh, for uh, errors in the building thermal envelope control layers. And then we're going to also touch on how to comply with the current Illinois Energy Conservation Code, um, focusing mainly on documentation and detailing uh, for compliance purposes. So first getting into understanding the envelope's impact on building energy consumption. Um, the envelope as a whole has a direct impact on your heating and cooling loads, ventilation loads, and lighting loads through daylighting, uh, infiltration, and conductive loads through glazing and wall and opaque surfaces. Um, so there's a significant component for commercial and residential buildings, over 50% for each building type that is impacted by energy codes. Um, on average though, 30% of the building's loads come from the building envelope. Um, so while over 50% of the loads are impacted by it, about 30% of the loads actually come from conduction, um, radiation, uh, infiltration through the envelope. Um, so important to know that you're having a significant impact on a large uh, component of the uh, facility's energy use. Envelopes have two primary building interactions. You can have an envelope dominated building where uh, there's a high uh, or a small ratio between the building surface area and its volume. And in that case, the buildings will be primarily um, controlled by loads connected to the environment because you're going to have those radiant loads and conductive loads coming through the envelope impacting most spaces within the structure. Larger buildings, most commercial sites, will be core dominated buildings where the perimeter rooms and locations in the building will be impacted by envelope loads and the core of the building is going to be primarily impacted by ventilation, cooling, and lighting loads. Um, and because of ventilation in those spaces, it's still closely linked to environmental conditions um, as conditioning ventilation is one of the primary energy components for HVAC systems. But it's important to note that for core dominated buildings, the envelope loads themselves are of smaller proportion of the overall building uh, envelope loads uh, as uh, compared to uh, envelope dominated buildings. What we do want to talk about though is for any building type, passive design principles can help reduce those envelope loads. Um, so for any building that you design and structure, the way the building is oriented to take advantage of solar loads and thermal massing can offset heating loads in the building and offset cooling loads. Um, taking advantage of daylighting can also offset lighting loads in the building. Uh, so it's important to be able to uh, position and design a building in order to take full advantage of those, whether that's the primary goal of the building is to be a passive design building or not. Um, even for a, a typical office building, taking advantage of those loads can have a significant impact on the size of the HVAC equipment. If you can reduce the size of the HVAC equipment, you can uh, trade costs for envelope improvements. Um, and you also save space in the building. Because that HVAC system is smaller, the ductwork can be smaller. The mechanical rooms that house that HVAC equipment can be smaller. Um, if you're placing it on the roof, the loads on the roof can be smaller, which you can trade off structurally. Um, so there's a lot of trade-offs where you can improve the envelope um, and that is a, a permanent component of the building um, and that will uh, take away from the expense you have to put into an oversized HVAC system to handle excessive solar loads or something like that. Um, and the envelope is a semi-permanent component of the building system. 
Uh, most of the design choices that you make for the envelope are going to be with the building for the life of the building. Unlike lighting and HVAC systems that can be swapped out over time, the general structure of the envelope is going to remain unchanged for the grand majority of the building's life. Um, you can make some envelope improvements such as glazing upgrades or improving insulation in certain parts of the building. Um, but a lot of the passive components like shading, orientation of the building, those are permanent fixtures that have a lasting impact on the building's energy consumption. Uh, so just an overview of those passive building design strategies, orienting the buildings so that the long sides of the building face north and south to maximize um, solar um, radiation. You can use that for offsetting heating loads in the winter time. If you add shading to that side of the building, then you can also mitigate cooling loads that come in um, due to solar radiation. Um, with thermal massing, if you orient thermal mass in the building so that it can be absorbed by the south side of the building, um, that massing can then offset loads throughout the day as that thermal mass can absorb heat <clears throat> from the sun during hotter times of the day and then release that heat over time during cooler uh, times of the day. Um, natural ventilation can also be uh, an excellent way to help reduce the sizing of HVAC systems. Um, you can take advantage of that to move air throughout the structure of the building um, and decrease the amount of uh, mechanically provided outside air. Um, so that can reduce the size of fans and blower systems and duct systems. Um, <clears throat> and also, you've got a, a benefit for the health of the occupants by bringing more outside air through the building. Uh, many studies have shown that increasing the amount of outside air that flows through buildings beyond the minimum recommendations from ASHRAE have uh, significant benefits for the health and the uh, cognitive function of the uh, occupants of the building. And lastly, there are landscape and natural shading things that can be uh, in implemented around the building. Um, things like placing trees for shade on the south side of the building uh, can offset glare and offset heating gains from solar loads. Um, <clears throat> and you can also set up uh, vine trellises and such um, where you've got a natural way from your landscaping choices to shade the building when shade is needed and as those leaves fall off in the fall and winter now you can have sunlight enter the building and provide part of the heating load. Um. <clears throat> and so we wanted to touch on there are ways um, to do these kind of passive studies uh, for buildings early in design development. Um, the example image here is from actually uh, SketchUp with Google. Um, they have add-ons for that program that can then do energy analysis for these structures. So you don't need uh, to go with an in-depth program with a lot of detail. Uh, you can do some generalized studies early in the design process uh, to try to lay out the optimal passive design strategies for a new site. <clears throat> Um, and even if the envelope design, again, even if the focus isn't a passive building, um, it is of great benefit uh, to any building structure to consider the passive elements that could be applied to it um, in order to minimize those envelope loads uh, and their impact on the other systems in the building. So the next thing to be aware of is detailing for continuity. Um, there are multiple control layers in the building and if they do not properly align, it doesn't matter what you've designed for the envelope, it will not perform properly. And you're gonna have increased loads, decreased building durability and other issues. So getting the control layers right is key. Uh, we're gonna focus on thermal, water, vapor and air control layers as they have the greatest impact on the building's energy consumption. Um, and they all must work together effectively to form continuous layers. If there are any discontinuities in those layers, then you've got potential thermal bridges and other issues. Um, another thing to be aware of is um, wherever you've got building joints in the facility, um, those are where you're most likely gonna have those discontinuities. So the wall to the roof, uh, the floor to the wall, the window to the wall, uh, foundation to the wall assemblies, um, joints between discontinuous materials. Um, so there, there's multiple locations to be aware of in a design that can uh, should be the focus for detailing um, and having those detailed drawings highlight what you're doing to maintain the integrity and continuity of those control layers. 
we did find an ORNL, um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory field study that showed by and large for commercial facilities, they studied six uh, buildings out in the field. Um, and those facilities had similar construction materials, similar envelope designs, uh, similar area to volume ratios, number of penetrations uh, for service openings and, and ventilation um, and equipment. Um, the biggest difference in the performance of those buildings though was workmanship. Um, and so that workmanship comes down to proper detailing. Um, if the contractor has really good details on uh, building transitions, uh, then they're more likely to get those control layers correct and have a better performing building. Um, another thing to consider with building envelopes as technology has evolved, we now have a lot more um, building envelope systems that are integrated layer products, such as SIPs panels, um, exterior insulated finish systems where you're integrating air barrier control layers, thermal control layers, water control layers, all in one continuous um, system. Uh, so it's much harder for those to become discontinuous in the building details. Um, there are a number of design guides um, that offer up advice for how to properly uh, or better design building envelopes for energy efficiency and for uh, improved uh, performance and durability. Um, the whole building design guide is a very popular one hosted by the National Institutes of Building Sciences. USDOE also has uh, available the Better Building Solution Center, which has multiple articles, webinars, and toolkits uh, to help with designs. And the Architecture Construction Continuing Education Center has multiple articles and designs. Um, there's also the Energy, um, US Department of Energy has produced um, the Better Than Code design guides um, for improving 20%, 30% beyond the energy codes as well, uh, and getting a, a high performing building with envelope designs. Uh, another resource that I do like to point out is uh, BC Hydro has produced a building envelope thermal bridging guide. Uh, I like this one because they include tables in this guide of multiple assemblies and joint uh, conditions, and they rate them based on their performance. Um, and so this is a good way to look at the system uh, at your, you compare it to your current building designs and see, uh, are you designing for optimal efficiency with your transition joints? <clears throat> Uh, shown here as an example is slabs penetrating through the envelope. Um, we'll get into detail with these, but you can see that, you know, the old design where the slabs were directly connected and just passed through the wall assembly, uh, that creates a very poor uh, condition where you've got a large thermal bypass there that results in cold floors and discomfort for the occupants. <clears throat> Before we move on further, we did have a poll question to ask. Um, that poll question I will launch now. We wanted to ask, um, is the envelope considered to be a passive or an active system? <clears throat> and for those of you who may have questions during the, the webinar, go ahead and feel free to use the question and answer function. That should be towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, so go ahead and, and use that uh, Q&A pane uh, to ask questions you may have uh, during today's webinar, uh, we may uh, answer them either uh, as a uh, course of the webinar, uh, or we may uh, answer several of those uh, towards the end. So uh, do go ahead and, and use that Q&A function. Uh, we may miss some of the questions if you do put them into the chat uh, window. I have seen a couple of them come in here. Okay, looks like we've got most of our answers in. We'll share those results. Um, so most of you got this correct. The envelope is a passive system. Um, we do want to note that there are uh, envelope designs with modern buildings that are uh, reaching into uh, active management of passive systems, such as uh, dynamic shading, um, electrochromic glazing that can change its properties based on uh, an electrical signal sent to the, uh, the glass. Um, so there are definitely ways to make the envelope more of a dynamic system but primarily the main components of that envelope system are a passive system that impact the building's energy loads. And I will uh, pass it over to Ryan to take over for the next section. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and uh, as Sean noted, this uh, BC Hydro uh, 
thermal bridging guide is is quite useful uh, and, and maybe uh, very beneficial as far as uh, helping to evaluate uh, some of the designs you may presently be using. Uh, and, and hopefully you, you won't find that you're falling into the poor category. Uh, you might be in the, the regular or, or even perhaps the improved uh, in seeing how can I take uh, my next design to the, the next level up. Uh, it's, it is a little bit uh, 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 unique here as far as, uh, you know, they're, they're using more of the, the U value uh, or presenting it more as the transmittance value. Uh, as we can see here, the, the poor uh, would be like an R2 uh, regular might be closer to an R3. Uh, inefficient, you're getting into that uh, R4, R5, uh, R6 territory. So uh, something to, to be aware of and, and help uh, improve your design over time. So uh, something to, to try as you're going through is, is making sure that you're doing your pen test uh, on your, your assemblies as far as uh, using a, a pen to outline uh, the, the outline of the uh, assembly and make sure that you are able to uh, go all the way around the envelope without having to pick up your pen. Uh, and something else as you're, you're going around, wherever you have uh, two, uh, two materials coming together, uh, primarily the focus generally is on the, the dissimilar materials because of differences in expansion and contraction. But even where you have two similar materials, uh, such as uh, two wood surfaces coming together, in making sure that you're detailing that joint, because even similar materials, while they won't uh, have expansion and contraction uh, dissimilarities, uh, you may find that there are gaps where they cannot press together uh, hard enough to, to weld. Uh, uh, and, and cause a, a perfect uh, continuity through there. So as you're going around, anytime you have uh, materials meeting, go ahead and circle that and make sure uh, that's a good check as far as do I have all the details. Uh, and so wherever you have a circle, you know, making sure that you have a detailed drawing uh, of how you want that uh, assembly to be done. So as far as... Uh, we have four control layers that we generally consider as part of buildings and making sure that we're properly aligning uh, the barriers. And so uh, with these being the four control layers, uh, primarily focusing on water, air, thermal, and vapor. And so uh, if you are doing your pen test, this, mean that, uh, this means that you may have to go around your drawing four different times. Uh, depending on uh, the materials being used, because some materials may qualify or, and, and may be suitable as multiple control layers, uh, where you may have a, a uh, material that may be both an air barrier and a thermal control layer. Uh, and something else to be aware of as far as our air control layers is uh, making sure that you don't end up with two air barriers uh, within an assembly. Uh, you can have two air control layers where you have a, 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 a vapor permeable uh, uh, a vapor permeable uh, layer and uh, a vapor impermeable layer, uh, but you don't want two vapor impermeable layers because you can get uh, moisture trap between those two. So, uh, also being aware, uh, particularly at uh, foundation joints, uh, I know uh, commonly we'll see seal, uh, sill gasket or sill sealer uh, used, uh, but being aware that you may end up, uh, you may wish to uh, go ahead and, and do a little belt and suspenders there uh, because while sill sealers may be good for uh, preventing vapor transmission between the uh, slab and uh, the wall assembly, uh, it may allow air to pass through. So you may uh, need to apply an additional bead of sealant uh, such that the air barrier uh, is able to be maintained through there. Well, 
Looking at parapet walls, these can be uh, particularly uh, difficult joints. And so making sure that we're, we're calling out all the detailing in here uh, and making sure that we have continuity. Uh, the other issue that can arise with parapet walls, because if you have the, the outside is so close together, the in, that inner void is uh, fairly small. And so you can end up with uh, the uh, that cavity reaching dew point and condensing uh, water up here uh, in that little cavity. Uh, so here we're illustrating uh, an air barrier coming up the wall and rather than going all the way to the top of the parapet, uh, it's coming up and then going through the parapet wall uh, in, in this thermal control layer here. Uh, and so trying to align that thermal control layer to the best of, of one's ability. Uh, and the thermal and air control layers do need to be closely aligned uh, and in intimate contact with one another. Uh, either the uh, thermal control layer needs to be air impermeable, or you do need to have those two control layers uh, touching to prevent air from passing through the thermal layer uh, and allowing moisture and, and uh, other uh, coolness to, to pass through. So, as far as slab edges, uh, this is where it uh, can get fairly difficult again. Uh, slab edges, making sure uh, you're being aware as far as where that thermal control is. Is it on the outside? Is it on the inside? Uh, and uh, any making sure that you have thermal breaks, particularly for uh, where structure is coming through and making sure that you're breaking that uh, structure thermally somehow. Uh, for heated slabs, there is some additional insulation that is required for that. Uh, and here again, being aware as far as, is this an opportunity for the slab uh, slab insulation to provide some of this uh, this beneficial trade-off as far as uh, if I if I need a design with an R5 you know and I instead increase that to an R10 because uh, R10 and R5 is uh, very similar and, and readily available as far as uh, various sheet good products out there and the installation is uh, not substantially different between the two. Uh, so without adding substantial cost, this is one area that you can provide some uh, better, uh, better design uh, aspects and say, okay, if I do provide some additional insulation, uh, can I trade off uh, some of the, the HVAC complexities uh, that may be required otherwise? Uh, also being aware that the, the market is, uh, always developing new products, uh, particularly as uh, for things such as cantilevered slabs and heavy traffic loads. Uh, so where you may uh, have forklifts going through open, uh, open doors or, or other uh, vehicle loads coming through, uh, the products are now coming to market uh, that allow you to provide that thermal bridge and, or that thermal break uh, to prevent your thermal bridge uh, and still provide that, that uh, thermal control layer, uh, or a good thermal control layer. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit later uh, about some of these uh, cantilevered slab uh, products and, and things like that as far as, you know, if you do not use uh, those thermal breaks where that structure passes through uh, your uh, thermal control layer, that you can have some really dramatic uh, impacts on your building that would not be desirable. So uh, again, thermal bridging is, is very critical. Uh, you know, there are different methods to uh, achieving this and, and reducing some of your uh, thermal bridging, uh, some different options uh, between uh, cutouts and concentrating some of your reinforcement uh, some of these might even be uh, reinforcement materials with a lower uh, heat transfer uh, coefficient. Uh, you know, it, 
there, there's now a uh, reinforcing bar uh, that may be a little bit more expensive, uh, stainless steel. Uh, however, that may reduce the amount of, of heat transmission uh, through that slab, uh, through the reinforcing bar. Uh, so there are various uh, opportunities there. Uh, another is, you know, if you do have your uh, balcony slab, uh, going ahead and, and wrapping that entire slab in insulation and trying to bring that thermal envelope all the way around uh, that slab and, and make that part of uh, the inside. Uh, now that's, you know, generally a, a little more costly than some of these others, uh, but again, trying to uh, utilize and minimize uh, any uh, thermal bridging and, and make sure that you're utilizing thermal brakes wherever you can. So, and continuity is, is the critical thing here. So uh, for some areas where you may have uh, podium slabs, you know, again, looking at where is your thermal envelope. Uh, here we see a thermal envelope coming down the wall and then through uh, here we have the thermal envelope under uh, our finished floor. So this slab is outside of our thermal envelope. Uh, however, we do have uh, potential thermal bridging right here uh, through this slab and through this wall. Um, so being aware, again, uh, you know, here it's calling out our, our sill gasket, commonly under our sill plate uh, in here. While it may be a good vapor break between the concrete and the wood and the wall, uh, being aware that trying to bring that air barrier back in, you may need to supplement your sill gasket uh, with uh, a, a bead of, of uh, a bead of sealant uh, running along the uh, sill sealer. So. Uh, Again, here, just being aware where your thermal control layer is. Uh, this is one, uh, one option. Uh, and again, uh, the water barrier here coming up uh, and, and meeting into the, and mating into that wall uh, water barrier too, so. Uh, this is another option. Uh, so here, uh, fairly similar to the previous one, we've got our insulation uh, coming down the wall and then across our, our floor here using a, a different, uh, you know, a foil faced uh, to try to provide uh, that vapor barrier between the concrete and the finished space. Uh, and in here, uh, what we've done is added an, an interstitial, uh, a, a either a crawl space, if you will, or uh, a, a tiny basement or a very short basement. Uh, so trying to uh, separate the finished floor from your thermal control layers uh, and, and making sure that we're still uh, insulating. Uh, something that this can uh, make a little bit more, uh, potentially more difficult or a little easier uh, is some of your uh, fire safety uh, measures. So if you make this uh, a little bit taller, then uh, people being able to get in there to uh, treat the various surfaces uh, with any fire breaks that may be needed. Uh, and again, this uh, keeps your finished floor uh, a little, little more drier uh, because you've uh, separated that from uh, the, your likely vapor and air control layers. So here's another one. Uh, instead of, of having this slab go all the way through, uh, they've gone ahead and, and thermally broken this and moved the insulation. Uh, so the insulating layer in our thermal control layer comes all the way down through the slab and then passes underneath uh, this uh, podium slab. So uh, this is, a, again, another, uh, another option as far as how to uh, detail some of these in various areas. Uh, so again, putting the insulation right up against the uh, finished flooring material, kind of separating those two apart, uh, or here pulling the insulating layer under that slab. Now the benefit of doing this is that, th uh, that slab now is 
potential thermal mass for that building to use. Uh, so this can be a very good, uh, a good use of thermal mass to enable uh, reducing uh, HVAC, uh, HVAC uh, equipment needs where in the middle of the day and, and helping to do some of the load shifting where in the, the peak of the day, that slab is, is absorbing uh, that excess heat and then being able to release it after peak hours. Uh, so helping to, to prevent uh, swings in comfort, uh, particularly in the uh, uh, unfortunate case uh, where you lose uh, access to your, your utility system uh, or uh, prices spike dramatically, uh, such as we saw here in Texas recently where uh, the, the electrical grid went down uh, and, and that can play a dramatic, uh, a dramatic role on uh, what is the uh, durability of, of the buildings uh, and to be able to ride through that. So. Something else we need to be aware of is making sure that we're aligning the control layers. Uh, so here on the left, as we see, we've got our thermal control layer coming down the fenestration and it's pushed to the outside of this and our wall insulation or our wall thermal control layer is in here. So these, because they're not aligned, you can have substantial heat transfer uh, pass through that, which can lead to uh, that cold window sills and potential condensation uh, and mold issues uh, in uh, more extreme cases. Uh, so wanting to, uh, whereas on the right here, we've brought that fenestration into, uh, into alignment with that wall thermal barrier uh, or thermal control layer. Uh, so again, making sure that we're getting that alignment uh, together. So again, this is where it goes back to your pen test as far as can I trace it around and, you know, if I need to move my pen, you know, in, uh, in or out along the, the layers, you know, that can be your weak spots. So uh, here looking at uh, a window and floor, uh, potential thermal bridging again here where uh, if we're not uh, if we don't have our thermal control layers in a in uh, alignment with one another, uh, here's an example where it's it's illustrating that uh, on the left where we don't have uh, good uh, alignment with our insulation and thermal control layers, you know we had a dramatic reduction in the uh, R value of this wall. Uh, and I'll, even though that it had been insulated to R22 uh, because it was not properly aligned, we lost three quarters uh, of our uh, insulating value because of that. Uh, and we run into this similarly. Uh, if you are uh, designing buildings with metal studs, using cavity insulation can be very problematic uh, because the uh, steel studs uh, bridge right through your insulating layer uh, if you're relying on cavity insulation. Uh, so any buildings where you have uh, steel studs, we would definitely encourage you to consider using continuous insulation uh, wherever you can. Uh, that also additionally allows that cavity to be used uh, either presently or in the future for your electrical, uh, any HVAC needs, data, uh, and, and anything else like that. So uh, making those uh, cavities available for that uh, can be very beneficial. So, foundation, getting the, the foundation right. Uh, again, making sure you're checking your, uh, all your different control layers. You know, where is your air control layer? Where is your vapor control layer? Uh, anytime you're dealing with uh, foundations, you may be dealing with, uh, you know, water, uh, water not from not just from above but from below. So again, sealing uh, in both directions and, and making sure that you're getting that that full contact all the way through. Uh, and so, uh, where you do, uh, again, with many buildings, it's it's not a question of. Uh, 
if problems will occur, but when they will and how have we managed that. Uh, so again, having some backups and a little belt and suspenders is very good because even if we have a perfect material and a perfect assembly, unfortunately it is installed by imperfect people. Uh, so, uh, you know, making sure that we not only rely on uh, a, a first line of defense, but perhaps designing in a second and even third uh, line of defense. So when something goes wrong, you don't end up with a catastrophic failure later. So if you do have uh, exposed insulation, making sure that we're protecting that against physical damage uh, or the elements uh, of particular you know, ultraviolet, it can be very hard uh, on all of our buildings and, and all of our uh, insulation. So making sure that we're uh, treating that as best we can. So, uh, With that, I believe we have another poll question. We do, we do. Um, while you all are answering the questions in this poll question, we'll touch on some of the questions that have come into the Q&A as well. Um, but to review the poll questions, when should passive design be considered for a building? Uh, when you're targeting lead platinum status, when required by the energy codes for every building design, or when it favors good lot orientation. Uh, and number two, identify the four control layers that impact uh, performance of the envelope as far as energy, uh, air, water, fire, thermal, vapor, or pest control. Um, and there are multiple correct selections for that one. But some of the questions that have come in, uh, we had one come into the chat that was relating to the, the podium detail uh, that I wanted to touch on where the uh, two slabs were thermally broken. Uh, someone had asked whether that required an expansion uh, waterproofing detail. Um, if you're going to have uh, those slabs separated, um, more than likely uh, there's going to be some uh, differential movement between them. So you would probably want an expansion joint uh, for your control layers there to prevent them from being damaged by uh, differential movement. Um, but that does depend on that, that structural joint. There are thermally broken structural joints that are um, structurally connected to each other where you wouldn't have that differential movement. So it depends a little bit on the specific details, uh, but I would think for safety purposes and maybe a little redundancy, it would be good to plan for uh, an expansion joint for the waterproofing layer there. Um, our presentation will be available for download. We'll make sure uh, that the PDF that will be available for download will also have uh, the hyperlinks in it so you'll be able to go to some of the reference sources that we include uh, in the presentation. We did have a question come in. Uh, do we have available as some of our resources any industrial retrofit case studies or suggestions uh, for energy reductions? Um, I know we do have case studies available. I'm not sure any of them fall into the industrial category. Um, I know most of our case studies are uh, around the commercial side. Um, we do have a number of uh, wastewater case studies as well um, that fall a little bit closer to the industrial side, but um, that is certainly material we can work on in the future and we'll take that as a suggestion for, for something to develop. Um, Ryan, do you want to take this one? Uh, the best wall design is one that breathes in both directions, right? So why would you use a vapor impermeable barrier with a vapor permeable one? Uh Designs as far as uh, making sure that your, your vapor drive uh, is in, in a, a good location. Uh, I, I did kind of allude as far as uh, potentially having a ver two vapor, uh, vapor control layers. Uh, around here, uh, we do end up with uh, moisture drive in both directions. Uh, so probably around here, we, necess we, we would probably not necessarily want a vapor uh, a, a vapor impermeable uh, or a vapor barrier to be used. Uh, however, uh, we would want a vapor control layer uh, to be used and, and that it should be vapor permeable uh, such that a, a assembly can dry either interior, uh, towards the inside or towards the outside, uh, depending on the season uh, as well. So uh, yeah, probably for, for here in, in Illinois, we probably would, would definitely want those to be uh, somewhat vapor permeable. Okay. 
we shared our poll results. Looks like everyone got question number one correct. Every building should consider some amount of passive design in it uh, to help mitigate uh, building loads. And for question number two, looks like people got this one correct as well. Air, water, thermal, and vapor barriers are the primary ones to consider for uh, the building's energy performance. All right, so moving on, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about addressing problematic detailing. Uh, we've covered some of these already with like the, uh, the podium slabs, uh, but we'll get into a little more detail in some specific areas here. Um, one thing we like to reference is in the energy codes, uh, part of the residential section, there is this air barrier and insulation uh, table. Um, and in this table, it lists criteria for ensuring that those are continuous and well aligned uh, control layers. Um, noting that the energy code is primarily concerned with the, the air barrier and the thermal uh, control layers for the building structure. Um, water and vapor barriers are generally handled by the building codes and not the energy code. Um, but referencing this table is a good way to kind of cross check and make sure, um, even for commercial buildings as well, have you properly aligned your materials in order to maintain good contact between your thermal barrier and air barrier uh, so that that insulation is going to be at its optimal performance and that you're not going to have any discontinuities where air can pass into the building and result in infiltration um, and discomfort. Um, so again, uh, just uh, it's a good reference uh, to look at this table and compare that to your design and use this kind of as a checklist. You know, did I check my envelope for these various different conditions? You know, does my air permeable insulation have an air barrier closely aligned to it so the air cannot move through it? Um, you know, did you did you make a mistake somewhere? And maybe put some insulation on a on a material that's discontinuous where air can pass through it. Um, for air barrier continuity, you know, did you make sure that gaskets and seals and joints are, are going to be such that they can allow for some differential movement and not come apart and create an opening in the envelope. So this is a good table to come back to and just look at. Uh, we like to reference it as a, a means of developing a, a self checklist uh, to make sure that your envelope is properly designed uh, for optimal thermal performance. Um, so I wanted to touch back again on slabs because we see this a lot. Fat, uh, Concrete slabs tend to puncture through the thermal envelope on a lot of buildings. Uh, so this is the Aqua Tower in Chicago. Um, it's a very interesting aesthetic as you look up at it from the ground with the, uh, the waving form of the different slabs coming through the envelope. Uh, unfortunately, these slabs were not thermally broken from the interior. And you can see in the thermal images that this thing acts like a giant finned radiator in this, particularly in the cold weather. Um, and in the summertime, it kind of works in reverse. Heat can transfer through these slabs back into the building and add to the thermal loads. Um, and it's one of those things where um, proper detailing of these slabs with some kind of thermal break or a uh, structural thermal break um, would have prevented this issue and dramatically reduced the loads that this building is seeing for heating and cooling. Um, and so here we're just noting, you know, with a proper detail, you know, we're showing here that structural thermal break where you've got the concrete slab with an insulating material supported by some rebar um, that's holding those two assemblies together. Um, that's providing that thermal break and reducing that transmission. And then we've got a couple of pictures where uh, this is a, a high rise in London, I believe it's being built. Um, that you know they've put in these these thermal breaks on for these slabs uh, for these little square patio areas that are going to be overlooking the river. <clears throat> so another thing we wanted to cover was um, uh, radiant slabs. These are becoming much more popular in buildings as an alternative to forced air systems. Um, mostly because they're not impacted by air exchange rates in the building as much. Um, they can provide a little more consistent thermal comfort for the occupants in the space, particularly in areas where you've got uh, vehicle maintenance bays or garages, such as this fire station. Um, but you do have this concern where now that that slab is insulated or uh, is heated to provide that radiant energy into the space, now you've got to insulate under the slab and then wrap it up on the edges. And per the energy code, that can be anywhere from two to three inches of uh, EPS insulation that leaves a gap between your exterior driveway slab, loading dock ramp, whatever it happens to be, and the interior heated slab. Um, 
And so how do you address that gap and provide structural support so that the edge of the slab doesn't break down over time and the insulation itself isn't impacted and crushed by traffic moving over that material? Um, and so we saw the energy edge. Um, it's a PVC reinforced slab edge product that has some steel brackets um, that as you pour the slab, those steel brackets get covered up. Um, but that provides a little bit of structural support to that insulation. It's good for narrower gaps and lighter traffic like a, a vehicle maintenance garage, like a, a Jiffy Lube or something like that for lighter vehicles. Um, but for much heavier traffic, you may want to look into just covering that joint with, uh, we've seen uh, the insulation trimmed down a bit and using a, a uh, uh, thermally resistant epoxy uh, that provides a little bit of structure. Um, something we have seen is uh, using expansion joint covers um, and just having the insulation trimmed down enough to fit that expansion joint over top and that provides that little bit of structural support uh, for vehicle traffic so that the insulation itself isn't damaged underneath and that can maintain that continuity of your thermal barrier around the outside of the slab. Um, we've also seen for just like residential structures, um, if you've got a heated slab with like a, a patio door or something that goes to the outdoors, you've got to be able to support that sill plate for the door. Um, and probably the most common detail that we see is again that insulation gets trimmed down and a strip of wood is laid there. Um, because even though wood's not uh, the ideal thermal break, it's better than having concrete poured on the top of that because the concrete is much more conductive than wood is. And so there, there are options and materials for, uh, that allow you to detail these joints and connections uh, to reduce that thermal bridging through um, places where you would normally want some kind of structural addition. And that structural addition is usually a, a conductive material, you know, steel, um, concrete, um, those are highly conductive materials, but they do provide structural support. Um, so just some options that are, uh, they're growing in the marketplace. The more that we, uh, advanced building design and come up with more energy efficient solutions, the more we're seeing these these technical solutions for uh, certain conditions. Um, and one thing I wanted to touch on, uh, this is a personal experience I had um, with a, uh, a sports stadium. Um, the picture on the left is showing a large opening uh, between the, uh, there's a structural support for the floor above. Um, there's a, a third story to the stadium above this area that we're in. Um, and on the outside wall is a rain screen. Um, the structural supports, the I-beams for those made this pocket that was hard to see during construction. Um, and it wasn't very well detailed in the plan drawings. Uh, the plan drawings just had a top-down view of the wall assembly. Um, on the other side of this wall is just a covered patio with one of those perforated vented ceilings above it. Um, the air barrier was supposed to wrap around that patio. Uh, aligned with the um, the wall assembly. It's got a, uh, a curtain wall assembly uh, for glazing down below this area. And this is supposed to block off that open ventilated ceiling above that patio area um, from the interior of the building. Um, right behind me in these pictures is actually an, an open plenum heat pump. Um, so the return uh, for that heat pump system is right here facing this opening towards the outside. Um, and what we were seeing was the building had very poor humidity control because the heat pump couldn't keep up with the load. And in the winter times, the heat pump was able to keep up, but it was using so much electric backup heating that utility bills were out of control for this facility. Uh, so once we found this problem, went in, sealed it up, uh, tracked the utilities over time. Um, I'm not sure what the result was as I left um, employment with this particular agency. Uh, before I found out the results, but I do know from talking with the uh, the people that remain that there was a significant reduction in energy consumption and a significant improvement in the comfort of the occupants in that space. So very, very important as you're going through uh, plan drawings, look for those areas where you're going to have multiple assemblies coming together, multiple different structural connections, because those do always tend to create little pockets that get hidden away during the construction process. And those should be areas to focus on both in the detailed drawings and when you do follow up site visits to make check on you know, progress for the site um, and make sure those areas are getting properly addressed. Uh, the next thing we wanted to touch on is uh, verifying control layers uh, on site. You know, we've kind of addressed a lot of uh, common areas where these issues occur. Um, 
but for the purposes of keeping a project moving um, and not having holdups, you know, getting out to the site and checking on things during the process of construction can help find errors before they become a problem that hold up the project. Um, particularly starting with the foundation. If you've got an issue here, it can hold up the rest of the building's process because you can't build up on top of it until the foundation is correct. Um, so ensuring that any exterior insulation has proper protection from damage, uh, from termites, um, from if any insulation that uh, extends above grade, uh, that it's got proper UV protection and mechanical damage protection, um, and that the insulation meets code requirements. It's going down the proper depth. You've got the proper R value. Uh, so very important to make sure that those uh, details are correct during the process of installation. Um, another thing to be particularly aware of, uh, insulation is allowed by code to extend out horizontally from the foundation, but that insulation does need to be protected either by uh, a pavement covering or at minimum 10 inches of soil so that uh, that insulation cannot be uh, accidentally dug down into and damaged and punctured um, and reduce its effectiveness. Um, so these are things to check um, early in the foundation process. Um, if you're pouring a heated slab, very important there, you've got to make sure that the insulation and vapor barriers underneath that slab are properly installed um, and that you don't have errors with that installation. Um, so checking for continuity of that insulation that's underneath the heated section of the slab, uh, making sure it's that proper R5R value at a minimum. Again, we like to stress um, that R5 minimum, that's, that's the energy code requirement. The energy codes are a grade of D for your building. It's just passing. Um, ideally, you're gonna be designing for a little bit more efficiency in your designs uh, and reducing the energy of the consumption of the building uh, more than the energy codes would prescribe. Uh, moving up in the assembly as you start installing floors, if you've got overhangs or floors above unconditioned spaces, uh, making sure that that insulation is specified to maintain permanent contact with the floor above. Um, you can see on the uh, right side of the screen here, this fiberglass insulation installed, kind of a, a typical uh, residential installation. Um, but it's not full depth for those joists, so it needs to be pinned up against the floor. And you can see in uh, just the, uh, the top left corner of that picture where the insulation is kind of pulled apart a bit, you can see that there's a significant gap between that insulation and the floor deck above. Um, and so what happens is typically in these spaces, this insulation is left exposed, air can then circulate through, moves right through that insulation, and now you've got a cold floor for the occupants above. Um, so very important if you're putting in insulation to make sure that the thermal barrier and that air barrier are properly aligned. Um, it's a little bit easier to do with spray foam insulations, as you can see on the left, uh, that adheres to the surface as long as your chemistry is correct um, and stays there um, for the life of that insulation product. Um, but for a lot of these uh, spray foam insulations, and if you're using foam boards, um, being aware that they do have um, fire safety requirements as far as ignition barriers and coverings, um, or using foam products that are treated with uh, fire resistant materials so that they're rated uh, for exposure um, is very important for, for getting that alignment correct. Um, <clears throat> one thing uh, to note for you know spray foam inside wall assemblies, um, getting the chemistry correct on those open cell and closed cell spray foams is, is important because on initial spraying those foams will expand into the the cavity, uh, but if the chemistry is off, um, they can shrink back and then they'll peel away from the edges of the cavity. Um, and when that shrinks away, if you're using closed cell foam or four to five inches of, of open cell foam to try to get your air barrier and thermal barrier out of that same spray foam material, well, now you've got gaps throughout your, your assembly where that foam is pulled away from your studs. Um, so it's important, you know, do a sample spray uh, in a building, make sure that that foam is gonna maintain its proper uh, fill of the cavity. It's not gonna shrink, pull away, uh, delaminate from the, the assembly it's sprayed onto. And then once you've verified that that chemistry is correct and that foam is the correct mixture, um, that you can then move on with the rest of the product and applying it to the rest of the building. Um, fenestration performance. Um, this one's a fairly easy one to check. Um, 
as far as documentation and, and uh, site inspection, if you've got uh, factory assembled windows, they're going to have the NFRC 400 tag applied to them. Um, this is more common for residential buildings. Um, usually for commercial buildings, you're seeing a lot more of site built window assemblies, curtain walls and storefront assemblies. Uh, for those assemblies, uh, there is the component modeling um, application method uh, that the NFRC runs. Um, it's a library of materials that you can put together for a, a particular glazing assembly and determine what its uh, U-factor, solar heat gain coefficient, um, air leakage rate, um, those are all modeled in that. And uh, a report is printed out that gets included with your construction documents. Um, the thing to be aware of though, again, you can specify the perfect product that's gonna work well, but checking the actual installation on site is a key thing. Uh, we've got an example here of a curtain wall assembly that was installed into a building, but they didn't have the end dams applied to the assembly. So water got in, leaked through the edges of the window into the wall assembly and actually caused damage inside the building. Um, so you can see in the back corner here where the end dam is missing, and there's also no sealant covering that gap. And that's right where water entered the building. Um, there are other uh, issues that can arise as well. Um, with these assemblies, uh, we've seen um, the pressure plates that cover uh, the, the caps that cover the front of the building. Um, we've seen instances where sealant has been applied too thickly um, and it forces those end caps off. Uh, there was a building, um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but those end caps were falling off the building and landing on people underneath because as thermal expansion happened and things and that sealant expanded and contracted, it popped the caps off of the uh, curtain wall assembly. So making sure that those things are properly assembled, you've got the proper thickness of sealant, you're not overdoing it, you're not missing areas of it. Um, it takes a lot of focus uh, to get those details right. Um, so finding someone that's going to do a good job of focusing on that, making sure all those details are properly followed uh, is essential. Here we're touching on again the wall cavity insulation, uh, just some examples of uh, spray foam and fiberglass insulation. Uh, you can see here where I was talking about uh, this on the left side, the spray foam uh, application where the foam pulled away from that wall assembly. And now uh, this, this uh, I believe this is an open cell application. Um, you need four and a half to five and a half inches of open cell foam uh, in order for that to qualify as an air barrier and a thermal barrier. Um, if your depth isn't thick enough, if you've got uneven application, or if it peels away like this has, um, now you've got discontinuities in your thermal and air barrier of your envelope. Um, for uh, fibrous insulation applications, um, you can see here a, a metal stud wall, making sure that that insulation is applied where it completely fills the cavity. Uh, it's not compressed. Uh, there aren't any gaps in that insulation. Um, where you've got piping, electrical services, that it's uh, adequately split around those, um, trimmed so that it fits behind electrical boxes and panels uh, without being compressed behind those, those sites. Um, that way it's maintaining its proper design R value. Um, very key for these installations. Um, and again, as Ryan noted with uh, steel stud assemblies, those steel studs are highly conductive and go straight through uh, that fiberglass insulation to the exterior condition. So if you do not have some kind of continuous exterior insulation to break that thermal bridge, uh, these steel stud assemblies reduce the effective R value by 50% uh, or more of that insulation value. So uh, being cognizant of that um, is important. Uh, so if you're using those steel stud assemblies, making sure you've got continuous exterior insulation to break that thermal bridge will, will go a long way towards improving the building's uh, comfort, um, reducing the potential for condensation damage inside those wall assemblies, uh, ghosting on, on the fiberglass, or uh, not fiberglass, the, uh, the drywall finish uh, of those walls. It's very, very important to check. Um, inspecting roof layers, you know, where you've got above deck insulation, making sure that you know there's a minimum of two layers of insulation and the joints on those layers are staggered. That helps make sure that you're not lining up any of those layers where you've got a direct thermal break uh, between the two uh, sheets of insulation. Um, <clears throat> it also helps minimize air leakage through that insulation where you can carry vapor and moisture from the building up underneath the membrane finish on that roof assembly where it can condense, 
and then form bulk water, which can then damage the insulation or drip back down in the building and appear as a roof leak. Um, for insulation underneath the deck, um, very similar to floors. If you're using a fibrous insulation product that needs to be pinned up against that deck where it cannot fall away and it needs to maintain that intimate contact um, so that any fibrous insulation um, is then uh, fully encapsulated where air can't move through it and reduce its performance. Um, the, uh, the green check mark picture in the background is a metal building construction where they've got a liner system installed. Um, so you've got insulation that's filling the space between the purlins and then you've got a, a transverse layer of insulation on top of that with thermal spacing blocks that provides another layer of continuous insulation on top of those uh, support structures so that that uh, roof's overall R value is improved. The next thing to touch on is the actual air and water barrier on the outside of the building um, and ensuring continuity of that material. Um, we're seeing a little bit less of this now as people are moving more towards um, self-adhered membranes and fluid applied membranes um, for the exterior uh, water barrier and air barrier of an envelope. Um, but house wrap is still common in some areas and on some buildings. And it's very difficult to get this to be a continuous uh, weather and air barrier. Um, the one thing to be aware of with this material is it is not a vapor barrier. It is a vapor retarder to some degree, um, but vapor can transmit through this material fairly easily. Um, it is a bulk water barrier and an air barrier when properly applied. Um, but making sure all the joints are taped and sealed properly um, when you're uh, installing spacers, if they are properly spaced so that um, wind and uh, pressure in the building cannot pull this uh, layer away and create uh, openings in it, um, and that they're uh, properly capped so that as you're making penetrations through this with the nails and fasteners, those caps are providing a seal around that penetration. Um, it's all very key components for uh, house wraps if you're using uh, wrapping material on, a, on an assembly. Um, if you're applying fluidized membranes, um, one thing to be aware of with those, particularly on uh, concrete surfaces, um, one layer may not be enough, two layers uh, sometimes may not be enough, um, as that fluidized membrane will soak into the concrete a little bit and can leave pinholes uh, in that application. Uh, so sometimes at a minimum two, sometimes three layers may be required to actually get a full air barrier out of a fluidized membrane. Uh, for self-adhered membranes, making sure that they are applied smoothly, that you don't have wrinkles, because uh, those wrinkles can produce gaps and openings at seams, um, and making sure that they're properly applied in proper conditions. Um, if they're exposed to extreme heat, that adhesive can then peel away um, before that uh, material is covered up, and that can leave gaps in that, that assembly. Um, making sure that proper air barrier materials are used for continuity purposes. Um, the big area where we see this, um, where you've got a roof deck sitting on top of a masonry wall with some kind of structural support underneath, like these, these steel beams, uh, could be I-beams, could be these, these open web beams, um, but usually that gap between the wall and the, um, the floor plate or the, the roof deck um, we've seen that commonly stuffed with fiberglass insulation. Um, that fiberglass is not stopping air movement through this gap. Um, it's much more common now to see this treated with a spray foam that is also um, a fire foam. Um, it's providing that both an air barrier there and some fire protection. Um, but making sure that gap is properly sealed with the proper uh, air barrier material uh, is very important. Uh, there are some materials that um, are listed in the energy code as air barrier materials, um, given a specified thickness for some materials. Um, one thing to be aware of with these, um, it is specifying uh, one and a half inches of closed cell spray foam um, at uh, one and a half pounds per cubic foot. Uh, that does qualify as an air barrier. Uh, with open cell spray foam, it's specifying four and a half inches. There are some spray foams, uh, check with the manufacturer, that require five and a half inches of insulation. Uh, in order to qualify as an air barrier. So be aware of that, check that if you're using open cell spray foam for your buildings, uh, that can be a, an area that, that causes issues. 
Uh, and this is again going back to those those fluid applied uh, barriers and self adhered membranes. Um, this is a, an image on the top left showing that pinholes uh, that can develop if you're applying this to CMUs or concrete uh, surfaces. Uh, so again, going back once you've done an initial application, making sure that those pinholes haven't developed, uh, that the application was thick enough to prevent that or that multiple layers were installed to, to prevent those pinholes. Um, and same thing for self-adhered membranes, making sure that they're uh, applied with the proper pressure. Uh, the tapes and seams on those need to be applied with a roller uh, that applies proper pressure to that adhesive to ensure it stays bonded. Um, making sure where you've got corners, where you're wrapping that membrane around in that corner, that you're not developing wrinkles uh, or places where you can develop gaps at the seams in that, that material, uh, because those all end up as air barrier penetrations and can also allow, uh, as this is your weather barrier, uh, the potential for water to work back up into those spaces and create water damage inside the building. Uh, which you can see on the top right here, uh, this was a building with a fluid applied membrane, uh, but you can see the wet spots on the wall there from water damage. Um, we did want to touch on, uh, even if you detail your air barrier properly, and you're going out on site and you're checking, yes, we've, we've ticked off that we're aligning all our assemblies, we're, we're properly sealing all the joints in our, our air and weather barriers, um, you can still miss some things. Um, the residential energy code is now requiring blower door testing to ensure continuity of that air barrier. And as the air barrier is oftentimes uh, closely interrelated with the water bar uh, barrier um, being an, an exterior uh, material uh, to the building envelope, it can also help verify that that water barrier is, is properly installed. Um, but this test just pressurizes the building or depressurizes the building to a standardized test pressure. Uh, for residential, it's 50 pascals. Um, and per the energy code, um, it's not to exceed four air changes per hour in the state of Illinois. Um, if you're outside the state of Illinois for a project, um, that is three air changes per hour at 50 uh, pascals. And Illinois should be moving towards that, that rating for the next version of the energy codes coming in the, the summer of 2022. Um, but this testing is a great way to verify that you've checked all your things in your plan drawings, made sure those details were correct. You went out on site and checked them. This is an excellent way, the ideal way to verify that you haven't missed something that was hidden somewhere. Um, and it is a technology that can be applied to commercial buildings. You know, as we've improved buildings, um, commercial materials and air tightness, um, it's more and more possible now to use blower door testing for larger and larger buildings. Um, although if you have a very large building, uh, setting up a blower door such like this one uh, might not be able to do enough depressurization for the test. Um, it's possible to set up the HVAC systems with a little bit of preparation, uh, such as blocking off the exhaust fans and taping off uh, some outside air damper um, openings. Um, to then use the HVAC system, turn on um, the supply fans and use those to draw in air and pressurize the building. Um, it's a good way to run that test. Um, you can measure the, the airflow off those air handlers with the already installed BAS system. Um, and that will give you an idea of what your building's leakage rate is. And you convert that into a leakage um, per unit of envelope area, where the residential test um, is usually per uh, square foot, air leakage per square foot. Um, for commercial testing, the test pressure is slightly higher at 75 pascals instead of 50 pascals. Um, and the um, leakage measurement is based on the uh, square footage of the exposed envelope. Um, so you're not going to include envelope that's below grade, below the soil. Uh, it's only what's above grade and visible um, and open to the air uh, that's being tested in this test. Um, a single fan um, can move about um, 4,900 CFM at 75 pascals, um, which is enough to test an envelope if it's designed well uh, of about um, 12,000 square feet, a little bit higher. Um, if you triple those fans up, now you're up to 36,000 square feet. Um, so you can get to significantly sized buildings with this testing. And it's a great way to make sure that the visual checks you've done and design checks you've done on your drawings and detailing are properly installed and you've got good air barriers. Um, we've actually seen this as a great way to catch issues with curtain wall assemblies and storefront assemblies that might be hidden. 
that. So at this point, we have one more poll question we're going to launch. Uh, and we'll address a few more questions that have come into the chat and the Q&A window. Uh, but the question is, which of the following is the ideal way to verify air barrier integrity? Uh, the pen test, a visual site inspection, thermal bridging, or a building pressurization test, or thermal imaging, uh, sorry, or a building pressurization test. Uh, we did have a question come in about how would we address thermal bridging at an above grade exposed foundation. Uh, this person noted a general contractor suggested a high compressive strength insulation block set into the top of the foundation and extending below grade. Uh, the product is quite expensive and requires a significant amount of labor to set. Um, so this depends uh, if you're talking about like a brick ledge um, and supporting the weight of a, a brick wall assembly on top of uh, some foam insulation. Um, Standard foam insulation can actually, uh, once that weight is spread out across it, support the weight of those bricks um, at, uh, I can't remember what density that is, um, but a, you don't necessarily have to go with an extremely high density product. Um, I know for under slab insulation, some people have considered the uh, foam insulations that are used under highways, airport runways, um, things like that to provide a, a smooth surface. Um, but those are designed for much heavier loads and higher impacts that a building typically won't see. Uh, even if you've got a vehicle garage that you're, you're supporting the weight of a vehicle on that insulation, uh, the weight uh, is spread out among the four tires and that spreads out through the slab before it ever reaches down to the foam. Um, so I would consult with a, a structural engineer on what um, compressive strength you would need, but in general, for most situations, you don't need a highly compressive strength insulation to support those loads under a slab. We did have a question um, here, it says, uh, you say size heating equipment smaller due to the thermal envelope. What happens when a situation of no sunlight for several days, how does that affect the building? Is it a possible cause for a shutdown? Um, <clears throat> So um, it, it can get into an issue there. Um, this, is, this is probably likely a, a similar issue to any, uh, any building. Uh, if anything, an improved thermal envelope with a, a reduced uh, HVAC size, the thermal mass will actually help make that building a little more resilient than an average building. Uh, because the, the internal thermal mass of, of most buildings between uh, furniture, foundation, you know, people, equipment, uh, you know, that, that thermal mass is likely to be relatively similar between, uh, you know, one, one building and another. Uh, it, it may vary between building types, but uh, so for a given building type, uh, by having a better thermal envelope, uh, which would reduce your HVAC equipment needs uh, is likely to actually be more resilient uh, during a, a period of, of no sunlight uh, because most HVAC equipment uh, or most of the heating equipment is actually designed based on uh, the overnight heating load. So the, the when there is no sun at all to help. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's generally only in the event that you have no sun and you've lost your utility connection that you would run into a problem. Uh, and, and if you do have a better thermal envelope, uh, you'll have a, your, <laughs> your neighbors will run into that problem before you do, uh, or it'll reach a, a critical point before, uh, before yours is. Also, you'd be surprised how much thermal energy there is on a cloudy day that can still come into a building. Even though it's it's reduced, um, you know, looking at solar PV, they still generate some amount of light. It's a diffuse light. It's a much reduced, but it can still provide some offset of loads. Um, do we have any suggestions to avoid ice damming besides heat cabins? You mean heat cables, I, I believe, is what this is. Uh, ice dams, uh, again, that's uh, that's going to be likely caused by a thermal bridge of some kind. Uh, 
uh, and so trying to uh, identify where that that heat leakage is coming from uh, and, and trying to uh, prevent or, or mitigate that uh, we will uh, this may be seen uh, if you have a, a vented or mostly vented attic, uh, but there's a spot where uh, the venting is, is improper uh, or that insulation was, was stuffed in too full uh, such that uh, you now have a thermal bridge uh, through, that, uh, through that spot. So uh, yeah, just trying to identify where is that, that heat source coming from uh, that is actually melting the ice. Uh, and actually, the raised heel truss was probably one of the early design concepts that addressed ice damming by allowing full depth of insulation all the way out over the top plate of your wall assembly. Oh. Get back to our poll here real quick. Looks like most people got this answer correct. Um, the first few, uh, those are good ways to check um, in the process um, that you're, you're meeting your air barrier integrity requirements, but they can always miss something. That ideal test is using that blower pressurization test because it's going to catch a hole if it's there. So, good job, everyone, on that one. Oh, I forgot to share the results. But there, everyone can see that the, uh, they got the correct answer. I'll turn it back over to Ryan. Well, thank you. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, documenting the envelope uh, for code compliance here. Uh, and so uh, just want to bring it to everyone's attention that the uh, International uh, Energy Conservation Code, which is the basis of the Illinois Energy Conservation Code, uh, does have a listing uh, towards the front of the code as far as here is what needs to be on uh, the documents for code compliance and lists several things as far as the envelope. Uh, you know, our, our insulation material and our value, uh, details about our fenestration, air sealing details, and uh, making sure that we're depicting the building thermal envelope. Uh, and so uh, as part of this, uh, being aware of, of what these are and making sure that they are documented somewhere. Uh, they could be, uh, and, it, and it is good practice to make sure that all of this is documented in a single location now, uh, or at least have the, the have the references in a single location. So there may be uh, certain aspects that are on the drawings. Some of them are in the project specification documents uh, and the like, uh, but it is very helpful if you have a, a table uh, located either uh, in the uh, specification documents or the, the uh, on the drawings as far as here's where you find all of this information you know here's the sheet number or uh, the the uh, specification number as far as where this is uh, what that can be uh, very helpful for is uh, when you're going through to do reviews either the project team or the plan reviewer uh, they can easily quickly uh, run down that list and per, uh, also, if you do have it where uh, something's in a uh, drawing, uh, design drawing and in a design document or a specification document that you can quickly cross check and make sure that uh, a value wasn't changed in one location and not in the other uh, to be reflected. So uh, that's something that's, that's very good as far as having a uh, quick table of here is uh, all the uh, required items and where you can find it. Uh, this was uh, this is also very good if you're uh, able to name things, uh, very similar to how they're going to be uh, entered into uh, the various uh, documents and, and potential softwares. Uh, so here uh, for uh, this is a, a uh, grab off of a uh, comp check and so going through and, and calling out uh, you know which what the windows are and naming them the same on the drawing and uh, in the comp check document uh, so again making sure that we've we've gotten everything uh, lined up together so that's a, a very helpful thing if you're able to uh, keep your reference names uh, together so uh, also notes through as far as you know what is the various R values and, and U factors used, solar heat gain coefficients, uh, making sure 
uh, you know, the, the types of hangers, any spacing. Uh, and so this is where some, some various blow-ups can be very helpful as far as here's a, a small wall section and depicting, you know, here's where all my hangers need to be uh, for the various things. And again, making sure anywhere that you have uh, particularly dissimilar materials, but even where you have, uh, you know, an example of, of similar materials would be if you are using building wraps and where the building wrap layers come together, how far do they need to overlap? Is there any uh, detailing? Uh, do they need to be sealed with a, a tape or other sealant? Uh, particularly most, uh, most building tapes now uh, are pressure sensitive adhesive. And so making sure that we do roll those uh, to make sure that we, we have activated that, that adhesion uh, so you don't end up where it, it's pulled away. So, uh, part of uh, detailing a wall, you know, here we have it in a, in a uh, graphical representation of here's the various types of insulation and where they go and they're all labeled. And then we have a table. Uh, so wall section E7, and now we have a, a table and a calculation as far as what the U factor of that uh, wall assembly is, which then can be compared uh, into the uh, com check or res check or uh, building modeling software to verify, okay, type E7, type E7, type E7, you know, E7 should be a 0.06. Did it make it into the uh, correct, uh, did that make it into the, the programming correctly? So uh, again, making sure that you, you go through and are able to double check some of those. Uh, here, if you are doing a area weighted uh, compliance, going through and, and detailing out uh, for each window and then what's your, your uh, assembly U factor, what's its area, and then uh, going through the, the whole calculation. Uh, again, wanting to make sure that we've detailed everything uh, adequately. Uh, something else that we do like to see is right beside your window schedule, go ahead and put in, here's what the code requirements are, uh, such that it makes it real easy to check, you know, okay, the assembly is 0.33, that's less than a 0 0.38, 0 0.35, less than 0 0.38, 0 0.42, oh, it's gotta be less than 0.45, okay, we're still good. Uh, and so being able to, to quickly cross-reference what is the code required and how much, uh, how, what is my building, that can also be very good to demonstrate uh, to clients as far as I do better than, a, you know, I try to do better than a D and provide you good value here. Uh, code is a minimum standard. It is, it is not necessarily the best value, the best bang for the buck, uh, or even uh, good quality uh, it is, it is just the bare minimum. So uh, here we're noting uh, some of the cross sections and, and this uh, again, identifying here's our air barrier. And then wherever we have uh, two, uh, two things coming together and here we can even see, you know, I have a, a, a wood header with a, a wood rim joist. And again, even though they're similar materials, making sure that we do go ahead and, and put a sealant there, because uh, even though they're going to uh, likely grow and shrink at the same rate, we need to make sure we get that that joint sealed. So uh, again, uh, in here identifying, here is where those beads of sealant need to go. Uh, so making sure that we're reflecting that. So uh, heated slabs, you know, needing to, to make sure that we detail underneath. Uh, here we're actually showing a chamfered insulation uh, detail. The, the construction community has really been moving away from this chamfer detail while it is still allowed by code. Uh, the, the construction community seems to uh, have moved, moved away from that and prefers to either uh, partially tuck this uh, insulation under the exterior wall uh, to provide that layer of protection because this little piece of concrete in the corner is just gonna break off anyway. Uh, they, they may stop the concrete short uh, and instead use a, a uh, some sort of a uh, 
sealant over top to provide that that protection rather than trying to rely on a, a tiny sliver of concrete. So, With that, uh, checking as far as your, your summary page and, and checking here as far as, uh, you know, this potentially could be a, a data entry error. Uh, depending on, on as you're looking through this, you know, the difference between a 300 and a 600 is dramatic. So saying I may have had a data, data entry error uh, in this case, uh, for this, this design, they had specified zero cavity and zero, in, you know, no insulation in the basement. And so going back and checking the design and saying, is that a data entry error or was that part of the design? Um, you know, if it was part of the design, that's likely leading to a primary issue because here we have uh, for that one basement wall, the UA is 275 out of a total budget of 335. So uh, that would definitely be one, uh, one thing to, to look at. Uh, one thing to be aware of anytime you are making trade-offs, which the code does allow for uh, trade-offs in many different locations is we commonly see, and, and we will get the question from time to time, you know, how do I be able to trade off such that I have no continuous insulation? You know, I just want to load it up on cavity insulation. The problem with that, particularly if you have metal studs, is that thermal bridging just destroys your design. Um, and so uh, rather than trading and, and trying to get to uh, all cavity insulation. Uh, a, a, another opportunity uh, that, that perhaps would be much better is to see how much continuous insulation uh, would it require such that you don't need any cavity insulation in the outside wall. Uh, again, that leaves the outside walls available for electrical, data, plumbing, anything else you may need. Uh, plus, if all your, ins your insulation is to the outside, the likelihood of freezing pipes even in the event of a power outage, is dramatically reduced. So just being aware of some of that. Uh, software, uh, making sure that if you do uh, use a software, uh, it does, the, the code official is likely to require uh, not only the outputs report, but they will also likely want to have an inputs report so they can go back and check, you know, those wall assemblies. Did you make an a, a, entry error or, or something where, you know, hey, this wall assembly says it's a, a 0 0.02. That's really unusual. So let, let me go back and, and check that. Uh, now you may you may actually have a very good wall assembly and, and hit a 0 0.02, uh, but giving the ability to check into that. So uh, with that, I'm we do have several more questions that have come in, but uh, I do want to thank everyone because uh, we, we uh, and we will stay for a few more questions, uh, but we do have a, a final poll question as far as uh, which control layers do the energy code requirements pre predominantly focus on? Uh, you can choose one or more. And then when completing a software submission for plan review, it is important to match assembly labeled keys to the assembly lists in the software, yes or no? No. Uh, So we had a question here about what do we see used as a membrane covering over rigid insulation on the outside of a foundation that can extend up to the top of the floor slab. Um, there are multiple uh, solutions that we have seen used. Uh, we've seen uh, a stucco finish applied to the outside. Um, EPDM membrane uh, is a UV resistant membrane. It's flexible so you can you can work with it a little bit and even tie that into the walls uh, water resistant membrane. Um, so you have a continuous uh, layer there. Um, the main thing that we see as a concern for tying in any uh, solution to the outside of that, that insulation is making sure um, you can still check for termites. Um, and so some building code departments will require a visual strip uh, above that insulation, which is really, you know, that's right where the insulation is needed most. You've got a highly conductive foundation material but you're requiring it to be exposed so you can check for termites. Um, if you can work with your building officials, uh, a common solution we see to that is a metal termite plate. Um, 
that goes all the way through that exterior insulation. That way, if there are termites to get into that insulation, they have to expose themselves on that metal plate um, before they can get to any materials. And that does provide a visual inspection area. Um, but yeah, we've, we've seen stucco, uh, metal plates, um, EPDM membranes have all been used uh, as common finishes on, for exterior foundation insulation. Uh, we, I think we've also seen um, UV treated or painted uh, PVC as a protective material as well. Uh, we will be following up. This, this uh, presentation will be available as a PDF. We'll make sure all the hyperlinks are enabled in it, um, and we will send that out after this. It'll also be available on our website. Um, so if we do somehow happen to miss you in an email, we'll be following up with a uh, certificate of completion for this course. Um, which we will include that PDF in that certificate email, uh, but we'll, it will also be available on our website. So a number of ways to, to access this after the fact. Uh, let's go to our polling real quick. Um, just check how you all did there. Um, as far as which control layers does the energy code primarily focus on, it is both the thermal and the air control layer um, because those, those are uh, important for the air tightness of the building and the thermal efficiency of the envelope water and vapor control layers are both more concerned uh, and covered in the uh, building codes and not the energy codes. Um, and then when completing software submission, yes, it is important to make sure that uh, assembly keys match uh, for both the uh, drawings and uh, the entries into the software programs. I think everyone got that one correct. Okay. Got a couple other questions. Um, residential pressure testing, is this required for the Chicago code? Um, for commercial buildings, it is not required. For residential buildings, um, new construction, it is a requirement for new construction buildings. Um, for existing buildings, uh, pressure testing is not a requirement, um, although we do find that it is beneficial. Here's a question kind of going back to our, our uh, vapor impermeable barriers uh, here. A uh, question regarding uh, looking at a fluid applied on a CMU uh, product followed by two inches of continuous uh, rigid insulation on the outside uh, saying, would that be uh, where a vapor impermeable built barrier would be okay in building five? Uh, again, this is where uh, you know, it's, there's nothing that says you can't use one. Uh, however, this is something to be aware of as far as which direction uh, is water likely to enter and which uh, direction is water likely to exit. So uh, for this uh, particular uh, example, looks like, uh, you know, if you have your uh, water barrier on the outside, your, your bulk water and trying to prevent uh, moisture drive, uh, trying to go uh, out from the inside, uh, this this likely would be uh, a fine installation. So again, where here you have your vapor barrier is on the inside of this wall assembly or on the inside of the uh, thermal barrier, uh, that actually would be uh, would generally be fine because uh, your water your wall assembly is able to dry out, not in. Uh, so there, there, that's probably going to be a fine, fine thing. But just being aware as far as uh, do you have a uh, two vapor barriers in an assembly? That's definitely something to avoid. Uh, Here, I, uh, go ahead. I think Sean, you you had cover, talked a little bit about the the spray foam insulation and in uh, being. Uh, non-adherence or having difficulties adhering to materials. Uh, do you find that that's more of a, a material uh, match issue or is it more of a uh, chemical uh, chemical mix uh, issue? Yeah, usually if it doesn't adhere, it's because the chemical mix is off and as the foam dries after initial expansion, um, if that chemical mix is wrong, as it dries, it will shrink and pull away from the surface and that can cause it to not adhere. Um, if a material is wet, uh, your 
more than likely not going to have proper adherence. So if you've got uh, spraying onto wood that's damp, um, you'll probably have some adherence issues there. That and you're also trapping that moisture in the wood, at least on the one side where you've got the foam application. Um, so important to use dry, clean surfaces when you're spraying that foam. Um, I don't know of any materials that it does not adhere to. Uh, the only thing I could think of would be like a PVC material, uh, but it adheres to adheres to metal, wood, uh, so most materials shouldn't be an issue. Um, have we seen blower door tests for industrial type facilities like warehouses? Um, usually I've seen blower door testing for small commercial um, and um, places like condos and apartment structures. Um, large commercial buildings, um, I have seen um, blower door systems that are uh, they're giant fans on the back of a semi truck. Um, those are uh, very rare though. Um, usually if pressure testing is done in a large building or an industrial type building, uh, you're using the building's own HVAC system to build that pressure. Um, and usually for industrial type facilities, um, that kind of testing is exceedingly rare. It's usually more commercial and, and uh, residential. Uh, Kevin had a good question here about the bat and flash system. Um, this is a, a combination of spray foam uh, that's applied. Uh, it's usually a layer of closed cell spray foam applied to the backside of a uh, wall cavity that provides your air barrier and then finishing out the rest of the cavity with either blown in insulation or fiberglass bats. Um, so you've got a the com combined spray foam insulation and a bat insulation. Uh, it's a lower cost way to do uh, spray foam air sealing where you're not having the expense of a full cavity depth of spray foam. Um, the issue with that is that you don't have a continuous uh, thermal barrier then. So you do still need uh, an exterior thermal insulation that's continuous to provide that thermal break from the wall studs. Um, this may be another one uh, because the uh, if you do uh, apply spray foam uh, in, a, in a particular thickness that can be an air barrier or a uh, vapor barrier and again putting the vapor barrier outside of your thermal uh, thermal envelope or your thermal insulation uh, that's something that you may need to uh, look at a dew point calculation uh, to make sure that you're not uh, having an imbalance between your, your uh, spray foam insulation and your bat uh, insulation and, and end up with a dew point inside. Quick answer uh, to a question on if we were using the 2021 residential code for this presentation. Uh, we were using the 2018 uh, commercial and residential codes for reference uh, as the 2021 code is not in effect in Illinois until uh, I believe the summer of 2022. Uh, so we are still referencing the 2018 code. However, um, the topics that we covered as far as making sure there's proper alignment between the thermal and air barriers, there won't be much change for that in the 2021 code. Uh, the relative R values that we listed may change a little bit. Um, okay. Are there GBCI uh, continuing education credits available for this series? I do not believe we are offering um, GBCI credits. Um, Ryan, I don't know if we've touched on, I don't think we've offered GBCI credits for, for our presentations before. Yeah, uh, we, we have made some inquiries before. Uh, our, our credits are available for uh, several different programs. I'm not sure as far as GBCI, uh, but we do provide those certificates. So for uh, those that may uh, use self-reporting systems, uh, you may inquire as far as if they will uh, provide, uh, use those credits for that. Uh, we are, are we aware of any villages that offer optional pre-design reviews in addition to permit review to encourage uh, design energy improvements early in the process? Um, I am not aware of any that do pre-design reviews, although uh, CDAC does offer new construction design assistance. Um, so you can work with us and we can look at your, your plan designs and try to help optimize. Um, but 
as, as far as I know, there aren't any municipalities that offer a pre-design review process. Um, that's a good question. A uh, topic came up regarding bad insulation and wood stud walls. Is the proper application to staple the paper face to the front of the studs or to the inside edge? And Ryan, you've covered this one before, so I'll let you take it. Sure. Uh, the, the correct answer is read the manufacturer's directions because different manufacturers have different answers on this. Uh, the, the, we, we do see some concerns uh, as far as uh, installation of bat insulation and, and wood studs uh, because <clears throat> uh, the, the craft face paper is supposed to be a vapor retarder and then you punch a bunch of staples in it and, and in particular rarely are those capped staples uh, and so uh, you end up with a, a vapor retarder with a whole bunch of holes in it uh, but as far as whether to the, the proper application is to staple on the face of the stud or on the inside edge, check with the manufacturer of the insulation. I will say though that if you are stapling on the inside edge, you are more likely to leave a small air gap there as that paper face compresses the edges of that insulation. Um, yep. So my preference is to find an insulation where you're face stapling that. Always go with the installation instructions. Um, at what time do you do pressure testing? Um, as soon as your envelope is um, complete, you've punched all the holes in your air barrier and sealed them back up. Ideally, you're going to do this pressure test before you start installing the actual insulation. Um, if you're using spray foam and that spray foam is part of your air barrier, that gets a little bit challenging. Um, but you want to do the pressure test um, early in the construction process to the point where you can, if there is an issue where you're not meeting um, the air leakage requirements that you can go through and inspect and find where the leakage is at. Um, once you've got drywall up and all the insulations in place, it's much harder to find those openings if they do exist. Um, so as, as early as possible at the completion of the air barrier for your envelope is, is when the ideal time to do that pressure test. A question here on downsides to insulated concrete forms. Uh, carbon footprint is the, the predominant one there, uh, but ICFs, they're, they're very good as far as, you know, an air barrier, a good, good thermal, uh, thermal properties on it. Uh, so it, it, it ticks a lot of the boxes. Uh, ICF can be, can be very good, uh, but, but concrete is very carbon intense. So that's one thing to, to definitely be aware of. I have heard there may be some downsides with moisture transport, um, but if you have proper detailing as far as, you know, getting that uh, gasket seal between the foundation slab and the wall that breaks any kind of vapor transport up from the soil into the concrete, um, that usually should not be an issue. But it does take proper detailing to get that correct. Are there energy code exceptions to the perimeter um, SOG insulation requirement, i.e. modeling? This gap is difficult to span with flooring and in our experience, engineers are hesitant to overhang the sill plate of the exterior wall to cover. Um, so as we mentioned here uh, earlier in the presentation, um, we have seen where that insulation is trimmed down and an epoxy sealant is used that has a little bit higher thermal resistance than the concrete to provide a bit of a thermal break. Um, we've also seen, um, instead of cantilevering the wall over that insulation gap, um, a double sill plate where maybe use a two by six sill plate with a two by four on top of that, um, that goes out to the exterior wall and that covers that insulation gap and kind of pre-builds in your carpet nailer if you're installing carpets in the facility. Um, so there, there are a couple of ways to get around that. Um, if you've got a two by six wall, generally engineers are not hesitant about overhanging a two by six wall over that gap. Um, two by four walls are where that, that comes an issue. Um, but as far as um, modeling, you can 
um, do UA trade-offs where you don't need to have that perimeter insulation on the slab. However, you are going to have poor performance of that slab. There's going to be that cold spot there. That slab is going to radiate heat out of the building in the winter and into the building in the summer. Um, so it's one of those things where the code allows you to do a trade-off in your design, but you're going to have negative results because of it. It's, it's important to have that slab edge properly insulated. Uh, do we recommend full rigid insulation below slabs for the slab to act as thermal mass with the building temperature? And what's the minimum thickness? Well, my particular preference for any slab is that it should have insulation under it to decouple it from the ground. Um, even though um, for modeling purposes, uh, that ground is a constant 55-ish degrees, um, once you've installed a building on top of it, uh, the immediate soil temperature right under the building tends to warm up to the, the space temperature within the building um, where that heat transfer is limited. It is still there. Um, and what tends to happen is if you try to change the temperature, um, you dump a lot of heat into the soil before it impacts the space. So there's a little bit of latency there. Um, so uh, particularly if you're using a slab for thermal mass, um, I think that R5 is a good minimum um, insulation value to start with. Um, but again, that, that's kind of the minimum. Um, it will give you that break uh, from the ground beneath you. Uh, particularly important if you've got moist soils, um, as uh, moisture in the soil will carry heat away much faster than dry soil will. Um, but I think that the R5 for heated slabs, uh, if you're going to use uh, the thermal mass of the slab as a component of the building, uh, and R5 is, is probably a good area to start. But there are the design guides that do touch on thermal massing, um, and those are good places to look for references as well. That may also be another area where you'll be looking at some of your, your building modeling and saying, okay, well, if I do an R5, how does that impact my model? You know, if I, if I up it to a, a 10, you know, 15, et cetera, and perhaps, uh, you know, different buildings will be, have different answers. Final note before we go, for anyone who's still uh, listening, um, we will be following up with the certificate of completion. When you receive that email, reply with your AIA member number, and we will get your continuing education credits uh, turned in for you. So thank you all for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and found it useful. And uh, we hope you can come back for the two remaining webinars in our series. So have a wonderful afternoon.